Steve Earl and his beard. How'd that, how'd that beard get going there, Steve? Was that a, uh, well, you just kind of start growing one day and you're like, what the hell, let it go? Well, it was, uh, yeah, if you don't shave, this is, <laughs> for a really long time, this is what happens. Um, it started with, uh, I think the first time I ever grew it on purpose, I used to go through periods of not shaving and I'd have a beard. I've had a beard several times in my life. And then when I started having to keep them was when I started acting. And um, in the wire, I had a beard. It wasn't anywhere near this big. But, you know, if I, you know, I'd get these calls from David Simon, you need to grow the beard back because you're going to be in the next season. And, and uh, you know, I got the call towards the end of uh, the last season and uh, well, towards the end of the fourth season, you know, to grow it back because he was going to ride me into a couple of episodes at the end of four. So to, to have me in five a lot because five was going to be the last season. And then uh, I shaved it off as soon as the wire was over. And Tim Blake Nelson called me in to read for this movie. And the first thing he said when he walked in, he goes, oh, you shaved off the beard. <laughs> and he goes, well, depending on how this goes, you may need to, to grow it back. So. You know, and I got the part, so, it, so I, I grew it back for that. So and I've had well. it pretty much ever since, because it, it made sense in Treme, and, and um, Harley got shaggier and shaggier, and I couldn't cut it. And now I have a three-year-old, and he would not recognize me. I'll, I'll shave it off now uh, when I have when somebody pays me a lot of money for a movie, um, <laughs> or when and they need the beard to be gone, or when when I can, you know, decide I want to do it, and I and John Henry's old enough to stand right there and watch me do it and so he'll understand what it is and who the guy is that shows up in the house after I shave it off. So, so speaking of The Wire, uh, I'm probably about a decade behind here, but I just watched it like earlier this year, like the whole series, because you get hooked pretty immediately there. Yep. Um, and I was watching season three or season four. I was like, oh, that's Steve Earle. And uh, how'd you get involved with that? First season, David Simon um, has used my music in this stuff before. There was a, there was a uh, miniseries called The Corner, and uh, he used a song of mine in it. And um, he's, a, he's a big music fan. And he called my manager and said, I have this part, you know, this character I'm working on that might be something Steve could do. And it was a redneck recovering addict, required no acting. And <laughs> so I read for it in a recording studio in Nashville on videotape and uh, got the part. And um, I, when I went to shoot my first episode, David Simon picked me up at the airport and um, took me to all of the lonesome death of, ha of Hattie Carroll sites uh, before he took me to the hotel. And then uh, after I finished my first day's work, we went to a ball game and we've been friends ever since. So, so did that lead to your work on uh, Treme? Yeah, he wrote, he wrote Harley for me. I mean, I, I had a part in Treme from the time HBO bought it and... Um, and it was a blast, and I was able to plan for it because I was in it a little more than I was in The Wire. So I was able to plan for it for a couple of years, and we sort of released records and toured around it, which was tough. Um, my manager wasn't all that bummed when they shot me in the face because my schedule became easier for him to deal with at that point. So that See, that funny. usually bums a manager out when that happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just depends. I mean, I know people that have found out. I found out very late. I knew I had a feeling I was going to get killed, but they don't tell you until pretty late. And uh, they just, the, I, and I talked to David about it later. They put five characters up on the board and uh, at a writing meeting in the, in the break between, between uh, one and two. And they were like, it was about the story of New Orleans is dangerous. And I don't, you know, I'm not telling you not to go there. It's it's really dangerous, but it's really worth it. And there's some things like this. It's like riding motorcycles, you know. It's either worth it to you or it's not. But New Orleans is worth it to me. Motorcycles aren't really anymore. Um, New Orleans is. Um, it's, uh, you know, people get hurt there. And it's more than before the storm. It's part of the story of post-Katrina New Orleans. It was always a tough town, but no one ever got hurt in the quarter before. You know, no one ever got hurt on Frenchman Street before. And things have changed. And uh, we needed to tell that story. Somebody had to go, and it had to be somebody that David could make everybody care about enough. And then he didn't need him to finish telling, you know, Annie's story or, or whatever. And it sort of made Annie's story more interesting. They decided, so I had to go. I was like, they crossed off the names, and mine was the one that ended up left, so. So, uh, so you, you obviously do acting, you, you've written books, and you've recorded lots of albums. What's, what's your favorite? If you were going to choose one, 
What do, no, what do you I enjoy most? I don't have to choose. So why would I, why would I do that? No, if you were going to, if you, if I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, that's like I just wouldn't do it. The, I, I, it, it's so um, I would choose not to choose to make that choice, and and I, and I think that's my right. Um, this is this is my day job. You know, it's what I do, and and um, you know, it could happen that you know you don't get to don't necessarily get to choose those things. Like I could have. Um, never sold any records and nobody ever paid attention and ended up doing something else for a living. And I probably still do this. And um, so you don't get to make those choices. I've been really lucky. Uh, the other things that I do strengthen my home base craft. And, um, you know, I'm not, um, I do the other stuff because I can and because it helps. And, um, you know, I have fun doing it. And it's, you know, the music business has changed and it sort of helps piece together a living. It's one of those things. It's not, you have to do a lot of things to make a living, uh, make an art, you know, in, uh, in uh, the, way, the way things are out there nowadays. So, so I had fun following in, uh, in Rolling Stone. You do some, uh, some baseball commentary for them. Yeah, I did last year. I I, I'm, I hope they'll do it again. If if they do the column again, I'll I'll be glad to do it. it was I fun. I noticed you're you're a Yankees fan though. You're from Texas, aren't you? Yes, I am. So how how, how did that come about? Um, you, you know, I'm I'm 58, which means I was six years old in 1961. Baseball doesn't start in Texas until 1962 with the Colt 45s who became the Astros later. And, if, and anybody that grew up someplace that didn't have a major league baseball team in the 60s, who did you get on TV? You got the Dodgers. Or you got the Yankees. Those were the only two stadiums that were wired for television. So the first baseball, major league baseball games I ever saw were either the Dodgers versus somebody or the Yankees versus somebody. And it was, you know, the game of the week, you know, Dizzy Dean, Pee Wee Reese. And uh, my grandfather was a Yankees fan because he mustered out of the Army in New York City. And he came back to Northeast Texas kicking and screaming when his father died to run the family hardware store. And he was always a Yankees fan. I got my first transistor radio for the 61 World Series. And, you know, that season was Maris and Mantle and forget about it. I was, I've was i always been a Yankees fan all my life. So, Well, he's got a new album out called The Low Highway. He's playing uh, in-store at Music Millennium tonight. Let's hear some more music. Give it up for Steve Earle.